All right, so uh, so thank you so much for uh, for the invitation and also for the introduction. It's my great great honor to to have this opportunity to speak here. Yeah, so uh, I am going to introduce to you a wonderful compactification of a Cartan subalgebra of a, of a semi-simple Lie algebra, and uh, part of this is uh, joint work with Sam Evans. So the plan for today is. Um, I'll start with uh, introducing some background knowledge, and then uh, I give the relevant definitions and maybe a few examples. And then in part three, um, I discuss on geometric properties of the wonderful compactification. Okay, so uh, so we start with the background. Uh, I always work over the complex numbers. Uh, for me, that's in a sense the only field. Um, uh, I, I let u comma pi u be a Poisson group. Then uh, the infinitesimal information of uh, of u pi u near the identity element is recorded uh, by this so-called Manning triple. Uh, I, I wrote a quadruple, but people usually call it a Manning triple. So what do I mean? So here, um, this this uh, this symbol. Um, is called uh, the Drinfeld double of the Lie algebra U. And here, this this weird thing basically means uh, that U acts on U star and U star acts also on U. It's like it's like a semi-direct product, but both ways. And the uh, this angle bracket is invariant by linear form uh, on the Drinfeld double, and uh, U and U star uh, are Lie subalgebras of the Trinfeld double, and they are Lagrangian subspaces with respect uh, to angle bracket. And moreover, as vector subspaces, sorry, as vector spaces, um, Trinfeld double is the direct sum of the Lie subalgebras. All right, so once we have uh, the Manning triple, uh, we can define what is called the variety of Lagrangian subalgebras of the Trinfeld double to be denoted by L. Uh, so this consists of uh, Lagrangian Lie subalgebras of the Trinfeld double, and uh, it's quite easy to see that this is a closed sub variety of the uh, of the Grassmannian of DMU dimensional vector subspaces of the Trinfeld double. All right. So now, uh, now you may wonder. So why why do I can care I, about it? Can I well, ask? Uh, sorry. Can I ask? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Do we know go something ahead, about the connected components of this uh, this variety of Lagrangian subalgebras? All right. So uh, yes. So um, uh, so for example, when when this u comma pi u is uh, uh, is a semi simple group with the standard Poisson structure, for example, then uh, by the work of Evans and Lu, we know that this L has exactly two connected components. Oh, so one containing u and the other one containing u star. Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah, so that was basically my question was, uh, I was curious whether you can connect U and U star within this variety of, of Lagrangian subalgebra. Okay, so. Okay, okay. Great. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. All right, so, uh, so why do I care about this? Well, so if M comma pi M is a Poisson variety or Poisson manifold, and if there's a transitive action of, uh, of U on M, then we say that M comma pi M is a Poisson homogeneous space for U uh, if the action map is Poisson. Okay, so just like for a group acting on a manifold, we have the notion of homogeneous space for the group. Now for a Poisson Lie group, we also have the notion of Poisson homogeneous space. Okay, now when M is a Poisson homogeneous space for U, uh, then there's a so-called uh, Greenfeld map uh, going from M to the variety L and it's known that this map is uh, U equivariant, and uh, there's, a, there's a Poisson structure on L, making the Trinfeld map a Poisson map, and up to some technicalities, let me not, not be precise here. Uh, so um, this map is almost an embedding. So you can, can find you these, sorry, yes. Can you, remind, can you remind us how this map is defined or just you know, say- Right, right, right. So, so basic, so you, you send a point M uh, to, uh, I say X comma alpha, uh, where, where uh, so, uh, so you want alpha restricted 
to the stabilizer in U at the point X to be That way you can think of alpha as a co-vector uh, at the point M, right? So, so then what you can do is you can insert uh, this co-vector into uh, the Poisson by vector and you get a vector and the condition is that this vector is equal to uh, X modulo uh, the stabilizer. Um, all right, so uh, so where am I? Yes, so you can find these results in the work of uh, Drinfeld and then in the work of Evans and Lu. Okay, so then what is the upshot here? The upshot is that, uh, so every Poisson homogeneous space for U uh, embeds, as, uh, embeds U equivalently as the Poisson sub-variety of L, okay? So, so that way it's reasonable to regard this L as the universal Poisson homogeneous space for the Poisson Lie group U. And therefore, uh, it is important to understand algebraic and Poisson geometry of L. For example, it's important to understand U orbits in L, okay, because they are more or less uh, Poisson homogeneous spaces. And almost okay, an embedding so, means what? Uh, right, almost an embedding means right, what? So local embedding after a covering map is embedding, basically. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So, so for today, I'm going to concentrate on the following special case. So, so I let G be a semi-simple algebraic group of adjoint type. And G is the, is the algebra, G star the dual, and then G star under addition is an algebraic group. And on this group, we have a well-known Poisson structure called the kirillov kossin Poisson structure, and G star uh, with this Poisson structure is a Poisson Lie group. Okay, and uh, and its many triple is presented this way. Now this time the Drinfeld double looks uh, slightly simpler. Uh, it's only the semi-direct product of G with G star. This, uh, this is because uh, G star as a Lie algebra is an abelian Lie algebra, so so it's action on G trivial. Um, and then we have uh, the variety L of Lagrangian sub-algebras of the Drinfeld double. And, uh, and uh, the goal, so here, um, when, I, when I say the goal, I mean our long-term goal uh, is to understand algebraic and Poisson geometry of L. So for example, we want to understand uh, G orbits and uh, G semi-direct product, product G star orbits and simplified leaps, et cetera, in L. Okay, um, um, but um, unfortunately, in a sense, this goal is uh, almost impossible uh, to, uh, to, to be achieved. And why is that? Well, um, uh, so if you, if you look at my joint paper with, uh, with Sam Evans, uh, where we, um, we classified uh, closed orbits of the uh, group G semi-direct product G star. Um, so our conclusion is that all closed uh, orbits correspond to abelian ideals of the fixed rail subalgebra, which is quite surprising. But, um, but in that same paper, we also explained that uh, if you want to, for example, classify all G orbits, then more or less you have to be able to classify uh, all finite dimensional Lie algebras, which is a wild problem. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so this long-term goal is almost impossible. Uh, so what we do is we restrict our attention to uh, some uh, sub-varieties of L. So then, um, then in the second uh, part of this talk, uh, I'm going to tell you um, which sub-varieties we are interested in and why we are interested in these uh, sub-varieties. Okay, so uh, so any uh, questions so far? Okay, great. Um, so uh, so so remember we have this uh, Drinfeld double. So for simplicity, I'll write on uh, D for this. 
So what is the Lie algebra structure? So x comma alpha um, bracket with uh, sorry y uh, comma beta. Uh, this is going to be x bracket y, uh, and then uh, coadjuvant uh, of x on beta minus coadjuvant of y on alpha. So that's the Lie bracket, and then. Uh, the angle bracket uh, or the uh, bilinear form uh, is given by x alpha y beta uh, equals y, sorry, uh, alpha applied to y plus um, beta applied to x. Uh, so, so essentially the only possible formula. And then we have a group, uh, so E semi direct product G star for simplicity, I'll write maybe uh, capital D for this group. And multiplication in this group is given by uh, G alpha H beta equals uh, G H, and then I guess coadjoint uh, H inverse on alpha, and then plus beta. And of course, uh, the Lie algebra of D is uh, D. Um, okay, so um, so let's consider the adjoint action uh, of D on D. So I said that uh, the bilinear form uh, on D is invariant. Therefore, uh, the action, the adjoint action of the group D uh, preserves Lagrangian subalgebras. So we get an action uh, uh, of D on L. So maybe let's denote this action still by uh, AD. Um, remember that uh, in uh, in the Manning triple, uh, the 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 least subalgebras are Lagrangian subalgebras, right? So so in our case, uh, the least subalgebra G uh, is a Lagrangian subalgebra, so it's a point of L, and um, and you can easily compute the stabilizer inside D. Of this Lagrangian subalgebra, and you uh, you see that is equal to G. Therefore, uh, the D orbit through this point G uh, can be identified with G mod G, uh, which can be identified with G star via the map alpha goes to the class of uh, E comma alpha. And uh, if you write out uh, the corresponding Lagrangian subalgebra. Uh, well, so this goes to the adjoint action of E alpha on G, which is, uh, I guess, all pairs Y comma uh, negative coadjoint Y on alpha for Y uh, inside G. Okay, so uh, so the the, fo uh, the following definition. So I put uh, G star bar uh, to be the closure of this D orbit uh, in L, and this is called the wonderful compactification of G star. All right, so now, uh, now I let H be a Cartan uh, subalgebra of G, then H embeds into G star uh, via the killing form. So X goes to uh, kappa of X comma blank. Um, and uh, Mark, as above, G gets... Can you say something Sorry, about this wonderful... Was... Yeah, can you say something about this wonderful form compactification of G star? I mean, what are you adding? What are you... It... All right, so so this is actually very complicated. So I'll, I'll um, maybe let me finish the next definition, and then I'll maybe sure. give some motivations and then give some examples. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, right. So I identify this G star uh, as above um, uh, with this G orbit and this sits inside L. Uh, so then definition, uh, h bar uh, is 
the closure uh, of H inside L. And this is called uh, the wonderful compactification uh, of H. Okay, uh, now maybe before I examples, uh, let me tell you why I'm interested in these sub varieties. Uh, so as I said, uh, there's a uh, Poisson structure called the standard Poisson structure uh, on the group G. Uh, sorry, maybe I should say standard Poisson Lee group. And in a sense, this is one of the most important Poisson Lee groups, at least for uh, representation theorists, because this Poisson structure is obtained by um, obtained from the uh, the R matrix by you know left and right translation, and uh, its many triple uh, is usually presented in a slightly different way. So the Dreyfus double is G direct sum G. Um, and the Lie algebra G is usually uh, uh, in, in this presentation is identified with a diagonal uh, Lie sub algebra and the, the dual uh, is usually denoted by uh, G star as T. And maybe let me uh, just say that this G star as T uh, consists of uh, H plus X comma negative H plus Y, uh, where H is in the carton, uh, X is in uh, the neopotent, and Y is in the negative neopotent. Okay, so this is uh, this is presented in in, in a different way, um, but uh, we can uh, we can still consider its variety of Lagrangian subalgebras. Okay, and this is uh, this is studied by uh, in great detail by Evans and Lu. Uh, essentially, everything about this variety is known. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, if you oh sorry uh, I forgot to say so here the Dreyfus double group is G cross G. So for example, if you look at uh, uh, the closure of the G cross G orbits inside this L. Uh, then Evans and Lu say that uh, these, uh, these are fibrations over uh, products of partial flag varieties, and the fibers are uh, wonderful compactifications uh, of sub, uh, subgroups uh, of G. Okay, so, uh, uh, so what, uh, uh, I mean, why, why does wonderful uh, compactification play a role here? Uh, well, uh, so the stabilizer inside the Dreyfus double group uh, of the diagonal uh, sub uh, Lie sub algebra, as you can compute, is the uh, diagonal subgroup. Therefore, uh, the G cross G orbit through uh, this G delta gets identified with G cross G uh, modulo. Uh, G delta, and this gets identified with G via the map G goes to, uh, I guess, E comma G, a class of this. And, uh, and the closure of G inside L of G directs direct sum G uh, is the wonderful compactification. Uh, or maybe uh, it's, it's called the Pancini uh, Procesi compactification. Uh, of G. Um, and um, our construction of G star bar is completely analogous, uh, completely similar to this construction. The only thing is that we replaced uh, our Manning triple with this Manning triple. 
Okay, and as I, as I explained in the study of uh, G cross G orbit closure in L of G drag sum G, uh, uh, wonderful compactification of uh, semi-simple groups shows up all the time. Uh, so to understand this L, it's important to understand the decontinued Prochessy compactification. So in a similar fashion, uh, to understand our L, uh, it's important to first understand G star bar. Okay, um, now uh, if, uh, if you remember, so how, how do people uh, study uh, the wonderful compactification of the group G? Well, uh, uh, so, so, people, uh, so people take uh, uh, the Cartan subgroup, and then people take the closure uh, of the group, uh, of the group H inside the wonderful compactification. And then, uh, so people first uh, study uh, H bar, and then people uh, use, uh, you know, the action of the positive and negative unipotent groups. Okay, that's the usual way uh, of understanding this G bar. And um, an experience is that usually questions about G bar uh, can be reduced uh, to questions about H bar and questions about actions of unipotent groups. Okay, and that's why uh, we decided uh, to start uh, by looking at uh, the Lie algebra H bar. All right, uh, so uh, yeah, maybe before I proceed, let me remark that uh, this H bar is one of the most important examples of toric varieties. So these are normal varieties uh, with a torus action. Uh, such that there's an open dense orbit, which uh, is equivalently isomorphic uh, to the torus. And it's known that uh, each toric variety is uniquely determined by uh, some combinatorial data called a fan. And the fan corresponding to this uh, toric variety H bar is uh, the vowel chambers. Okay. Um, so, uh, so now let me let me uh, give you examples. So, uh, if G is SO two, uh, then G star bar, this one can compute uh, is actually isomorphic to P three as a variety. And uh, when when G is of higher rank, it's almost impossible to describe G star bar. Uh, in a concrete way. It's like for, for groups, uh, the wonderful compactification of PSL2 is isomorphic to P3, uh, but uh, for other uh, semi-simple groups, uh, it's, it's impossible uh, to describe uh, its wonderful compactification in a, com uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a concrete way. So this is why it's desirable to uh, start by uh, looking at H bar uh, so what can I say about H bar? When you say impossible. Um, so maybe, well, sorry, when I say impossible, I really mean that there's no simple uh, defining equations uh, or, I mean, it's, it's not possible to, to describe G star bar, you know, as concretely as something uh, like P3. Okay, but what about, what about, for example, labeling the reducible components of the exceptional, uh, of the exceptional locus? Well, at this point, it's not clear. Even that, even uh, not clear. so, uh, so. Sorry, what's that? So even even just labeling the irreducible components. Yeah, labeling the irreducible components. I mean, the irreducible components of the exceptional. Right. Uh, so so at this point, at this point, I haven't thought about that. So uh, uh, for for H bar, uh, I, I I can tell you what the result is. Okay. And uh, that's kind of the the, the point for today. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so, so, uh, what happened? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so just kind of um, a more, a more basic question, perhaps. I guess implicit in mm -hmm. what you're telling us is that the exceptional locus is a normal crossing divisor, right? Uh, for G bar, yes. For G bar, it is. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, all right. So, uh, so let's let's uh, 
let's go back to uh to to what yeah to to here to this embedding of h into uh into l uh, uh so i told you how to embed on g star into l um now if you if you write it out you you will see that um uh, this x in h uh, actually um, goes to y comma I'm killing form kappa of x comma y blank uh, for all y in g, but I don't want to write uh, kappa all the time. Uh, so I'll just write y comma x comma uh, x bracket y for y in g. In other words, I'm identifying g star with g uh, via the killing form. Okay. Now uh, we take a, uh, we take advantage of the fact that h uh, sorry x is in h, and this is one of the reasons why h bar is much simpler than g star bar. Uh, so I can rewrite um, this the algebra as uh, h direct sum zero plus um, the span of the following. So uh, e lambda and lambda uh, applied to x times e lambda, where lambda uh, is a root. So e lambda means a root vector corresponding to lambda. So all I'm trying to say here is that, uh, so I choose the usual basis for g. No, uh, you know, I, I, I choose a basis for h and then I choose the root vectors. Okay, so if h, uh, sorry, if uh, if y is in h, then I got y comma zero, which is this part, uh, h direct sum zero, and if y is e lambda, I got e lambda comma lambda applied to x times e lambda. Okay, so this is how an element x of h goes on to l. Uh, so uh, so. To, un to understand h, I first look at the following embedding. So h goes into c to the phi plus, phi plus means positive roots. Uh, so I send an element x to uh, lambda applied to x, lambda in phi plus. And uh, c to the lambda uh, phi plus, uh, sorry, c to the phi plus, uh, and that's into L in the, in the following way. So we have a tuple X lambda. Mm, I just send it to H direct sum zero plus uh, the span of uh, E lambda comma X lambda E lambda and E negative lambda, negative X lambda, E negative lambda where lambda is a positive root. Okay, and uh, then if you compare my definition here and our formula up here, you realize that uh, our composition, so this composition going from H to L is exactly the composition down here from H to L. This is easy. Um, and so uh, what is the significance? Well, the significance is that I can compactify C to the phi plus uh, to uh, P1 uh, to the phi plus, right? I, I just compactify uh, each uh, copy of C to P1. And it's not too hard to see that uh, we have a factorization like that. And P1 to the phi plus is a closed sub variety of L. Okay, therefore, uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, H bar uh, is the closure of H uh, inside P1 uh, to the phi plus. Okay, more concretely, uh, if G is SL2, uh, then I first have this map, uh, H goes to C to the phi plus, but this time we have only one positive root. So H goes to C, 
uh, of course, is an ISO, and C goes to P1, uh, and of course, uh, the closure of H in P1 or the closure of C in P1 is P1. And I understand this P1 as, so the finite part is H, and then there's a boundary point infinity. So that's what happens uh, in type A1. And then for example, in type A2, this time I have three uh, uh, roots, so each goes in C3, and this further into P1 third power. So now an element X in H, or how do I write it? Uh, maybe alpha X, uh, beta X, and alpha plus beta X, where alpha beta are the simple roots and alpha plus beta is a simple, um, but uh, sorry, it's a positive, but non simple root. And then it's not too hard to see. I mean, you have to spend maybe two minutes thinking about it. And then you realize that uh, uh, each bar is cut out uh, by uh, the multi homogenization. Uh, of the polynomial uh, x alpha plus x beta minus x alpha plus beta, where these are uh, 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 their, uh, components, sorry, these are inhomogeneous uh, coordinates on P1 to the third power. When I say multi-homogenization, uh, well, I just mean, uh, you know, x alpha one, x beta zero, x alpha plus beta zero, and then plus x alpha zero, x beta one, x alpha plus beta zero, and then minus x alpha zero, x beta zero, and x alpha plus beta one. Sorry. All right, so, uh, so I... maybe more concrete, Sorry. yes. And I just ask a kind of vague yes, question. Yes, yes, go ahead. Because you mentioned additive torque varieties in your in your abstract, I, I expected that for, for yes. uh, SL two, you I don't even even know if that's possible, but you would be adding two points at infinity, because that's what you would do in the toric case, right? You have C star and you add one point at, at zero, one point infinity, which corresponds to the two chambers, a chamber and fundamental anti fundamental chamber. But in the in this additive case, you're only adding one point. That's right. Uh, the, the 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 point is probably that. Uh, uh, the, the additive situation is quite different than the multipli multiplicative situation. So later I'll probably explain what uh, combinatorial data uh, determines this additive toric variety. And you will see that it's quite different um, than the multiplicative situation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also I'll, I'll explain why we add on this one point infinity later. Uh, all right, so uh, so let's look at the coordinates x alpha, x beta, and x alpha plus beta. So uh, so if they are all finite, um, then the point is just in H, no question. About that. Um, but if at least one of them uh, is infinite, let's say uh, x alpha is infinity, then at least two of the coordinates must be infinity. Right, because if exactly one is infinity, the other two are finite. So we have infinity plus finite plus finite. This can this can never be zero, right? Uh, so um, so so we could have infinity infinity, but then x alpha plus beta is uh, arbitrary. It could be a, it, it could be anything, and then we have infinity infinity, and then arbitrary here, and then infinity infinity, and then arbitrary here. So this is a P1, this is also a P1, and this is a P1 as well. So from this, we see that H bar is H and then different union uh, three copies of P1. And these three copies of P1 are labeled by, you know, X alpha plus beta, um, beta and alpha. Okay, so the boundary this time uh, has uh, three irreducible components corresponding to the three positive roots. And actually, uh, secretly, the right way to think of each of these P1s 
is that they are h bar for h uh, in SL2. Okay. And also these uh, three copies of P1 intersect at a single point, which is infinity, infinity, infinity. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, is everything clear so far? So uh, yes, um, but I, I have probably about the dumbest of dumb questions. Um, is it clear that your H bar is even going to be smooth? No, it's actually not smooth. It's not smooth. Ah, it's uh, not smooth. So for example, in here, for, for this H bar in uh, uh, of type A2. Mm -hmm. So if we look at, uh, for example, the infinity chart on P1 to the third power, mm -hmm. which I mean, by which I mean for each P1, you take the infinity chart. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so yeah, so let me write it here. So on the infinity uh, chart, uh, our h bar is cut out by, uh, you know, I would say one over x alpha plus one over x beta minus one over x alpha plus beta, by which I really mean, you know, uh, x beta times x alpha plus beta plus x alpha times x alpha plus beta and then minus x alpha x beta. So this is a quadratic cone uh, in the three-dimensional space. I see, I see. But it's, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. And it's interesting that this is a neopotent cone uh, in SL2, but I don't know if there's a deeper connection. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, but later I'll, I'll speak more about uh, uh, smoothness of H bar. Okay, um, all right, so um, so now we probably uh, proceed uh, to part uh, three. Uh, so geometric uh, properties of H bar. So from our SL3 example, you, uh, you may have the following guys. Uh, so here we have this uh, polynomial relation beta plus beta minus uh, uh, alpha plus beta equals zero. In other words, uh, the, the uh, positive but non-simple root alpha plus beta can be expressed as a linear combination of the simple roots alpha and beta, right? So, uh, so then uh, uh, you may make the following guess. So uh, for each positive root lambda, uh, I can express it as a combination of simple roots so then I get polynomials like this, and then I, multi I take the multi homogenization, they generate an ideal, and then does this ideal uh, cut out h bar? Okay, and the answer is no. Uh, so, uh, so one has to uh, take uh, more polynomials. Uh, so let me, let me explain. So, uh, so uh, as, be uh, as before, x lambda, these are inhomogeneous uh, coordinates. Uh, on uh, P1 to the P plus. Uh, now for each uh, linear relation, uh, uh, let's say summation lambda in P plus C lambda times lambda equals zero, uh, we have a polynomial uh, summation lambda in phi plus uh, C lambda, X lambda. And then we define the following ideal, uh, I of V uh, to be the ideal generated uh, by uh, the multi-homogenization uh, of all these uh, polynomials. So whatever this is, is a multi-homogeneous ideal of the multi-graded polynomial ring uh, C bracket x lambda zero, x lambda one, where lambda is in P plus. Okay, and uh, since it's multi-homogeneous, so it makes sense to talk about its vanishing locus. Uh, 
And this is a closed sub variety of P1 to the P plus. And it's easy to see that H bar is contained in the, uh, in the vanishing locus. And my first uh, theorem for today is that uh, the vanishing locus uh, is exactly, ex exactly H bar. So to cut out H bar, you have to take all possible linear combinations, uh, sorry, linear relations among the positive roots, homogenize them, and um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so uh, my next uh, step is to just, uh, uh, try to determine. Just a, uh, yes. a very quick question. So what, what sorts of mm -hmm. um, geometric features of H bar can you infer uh, immediately from this description of it as a vanishing locus? Uh, well, yeah, so for example, this helps us to determine uh, the boundary of H bar. I see, I see. Yeah, so which is uh, what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, all right, so uh, so to describe the boundary, I need some notation. Uh, so phi prime, uh, uh, this is a root uh, subsystem uh, of phi, and I say, that phi prime uh, is closed if whenever I have roots lambda and mu inside phi prime uh, such that their sum is a root, uh, then the sum uh, must be in phi prime. And uh, phi prime uh, is called good uh, if uh, phi prime is maximal uh, with respect to inclusion, uh, among all closed uh, root subsystems of phi whose rank uh, is rank phi minus one. Okay, let me give you examples. Uh, so if V is of type, uh, let's say A1, then I guess there's only one possibility for a good uh, root subsystem V prime, which is uh, just the empty uh, root subsystem. And if uh, V is of type A2, and then there are three uh, good root subsystems. So they are you know, plus minus alpha, uh, plus minus beta, and uh, plus minus alpha plus beta. Okay, uh, well now uh, you may have already noticed that uh, in our example uh, of H bar where G is of type A1, uh, there's one boundary component uh, when G is of type A2 there are three boundary components. And here, type A1, we have one good root subsystem. And type A2, there are three good root subsystem. Uh, yeah, so this is actually true in general. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about this uh, in maybe five minutes. Uh, now, uh, another example just to show you that uh, good root subsystems could be subtle. Uh, so, uh, so phi, if this is of type B3, so then the Dinkin diagram looks like this. So alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. And then uh, phi one prime, uh, this, uh, so I take the one generated by alpha two and alpha three. This one is good. But inside here, there's a, 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 a proper root subsystem uh, phi two, uh, uh, so I just take the short roots, for example, um, uh, in phi one prime. Um, this is this is uh, again this well sorry uh, this is of type a two, so rank the, the rank is also one less, it's also closed, uh, but not good. 
because it's not maximal, it's contained in V1 prime. This is of type B2, V1 is of type B2. Okay, so you may ask, uh, why am I interested in uh, good root subsystems? So this is because of the following observation. So if I have a point X lambda uh, inside H bar, and H bar C is inside P1 uh, to the V plus, and then I can look at the set of lambdas uh, such that X lambda uh, is finite. Okay, and it turns out that this is the set of positive roots uh, of uh, some closed uh, root subsystem of phi. Okay, um, so, uh, so if I want to discuss uh, irreducible components of H bar H, well, uh, then, uh, then I want the number of coordinates which are infinity to be uh, as small as possible, right? Because I want to Im uh, impose as, uh, uh, as few uh, constraints as possible. So I'm on a, I'm on a large uh, subset of the boundary, okay? So, uh, uh, so in, in other words, I, I want those lambda uh, such that X lambda uh, uh, is finite, uh, I mean, I want the set to be as large as possible. So then naturally, uh, I'm led uh, to uh, maximal uh, closed root subsystems. And this is why uh, I discuss uh, good root subsystems. Okay, uh, so now for each uh, phi prime, which is good, uh, I can choose, uh, I choose a semi-simple uh, Lee sub algebra G prime of G. And then uh, H prime A carton of G prime, uh, such that uh, the root system of G prime comma H prime uh, is V prime. I can always do this. And then when I do this, uh, uh, I can construct this H bar. Well, because H is the carton of a semi-simple, okay? And then by our theorem one, it's, it's a vanishing locus of the ideal I of V prime. And this is inside P1 uh, to the V prime plus. And I embed P1 to the V prime plus into P1 uh, to the V plus. Uh, just by you know inserting infinities. So when a coordinate is in phi plus but not in phi prime plus, uh, I just let that uh, that coordinate be uh, infinity. Uh, and then I can tell you uh, the structure of the boundary. Uh, so H bar is H, uh, different union with the union over all good root subsystems of H prime bar. So what is the boundary of, uh, of H bar? So they are just a union of the H prime bars. So in particular, uh, there's a bijection uh, between uh, irreducible uh, components of the boundary and uh, good root subsystems of phi. And also when phi prime is good, uh, a rank of phi prime by definition is one less than rank of phi. So dimension of H prime is one less than dimension of H. So the boundary is of pure dimension, uh, dmH minus one. Oh, sorry, this is theorem two. All right, so uh, 
So, so what do we add to the boundary? Well, we just take all those good root subsystems of phi, and then we take the corresponding carton, and then we compactify the corresponding carton, and then these are the boundary. These are what we add to h to get h bar. All right. Uh, now let me let me remind you that uh, we embedded uh, this h into g star, and then g star is embedded into h uh, into l, and also uh, this h is also a Lie subgroup of g star, and g star is a Lie subgroup of our d. Remember that d x on l. Therefore, H also is on L. Um, and it turns out that uh, this variety H, so this H uh, is a single uh, orbit uh, under, under the group uh, H. Therefore, uh, our variety H bar is H uh, stable. So it has an action of H on it. And of course, uh, there's an open dense uh, H orbit, which is equivariantly isomorphic to H itself. Okay, uh, so this should remind you of the definition of a toric variety, right? So except that we haven't proved that H bar is a normal variety. So if H bar is normal, then of course it's reasonable to say that H bar is an additive toric variety. So, uh, so, so let me try to show normality. So theorem number three. Uh, so H disjoint union, uh, union over phi prime good, uh, H prime, this time without the bars, these are all regular points or smooth points of H bar. So in particular, uh, H bar, is regular in co-dimension one, right? As I told you, uh, uh, the boundary, so, oh, sorry. So uh, H, uh, H prime is one dimension lower than H and the boundary of H prime is two dimensions lower than H, okay? Uh, so, uh, so, so H bar is uh, regular in co-dimension one. And then the next uh, theorem, um, this follows from our analysis of H bar above, and also it follows from a theorem due to our Dila and Booker, and plus some more arguments uh, that H bar uh, is Cohen Macaulay in particular, uh, H bar uh, satisfies uh, SARS as two. So then as a corollary, uh, H bar is normal. Okay, so now combining this corollary with uh, this discussion, it is reasonable uh, to add an additive toric variety. Okay, now as I remarked earlier, for each multiplicative toric variety, there's a set of, car, a set of combinatorial data corresponding uh, to it. So uh, it's reason, reasonable to ask what combinatorial data determines our H bar. Uh, how, much, how, uh, how much more time do I have? It's uh, roughly 51. Okay, five minutes. Okay, so uh, so then, uh, well, then maybe let me just say it in words. Um, so this uh, the, the combinatorial structure that determines this H bar is actually a matroid. Okay, um, and this well, um, this matroid is actually represented by a matrix, which has to do with how each uh, positive but non-simple root is expressed 
as a linear combination of simple roots. Okay, and then uh, then H bar is determined basically by the homogenizations of the closed circuits of this matroid, whatever those words mean. But uh, it, it turns out that there's a, there, there is uh, a combinatorial structure that uh, determines H, and it's our H bar. And you see that it's quite uh, different than the valve chamber arrangement. All right, so let me uh, let me just uh, tell you the last uh, theorem. Uh, so, uh, so I use the word uh, good root subsystems all the time, and they determine a lot of structure of H bar, but I haven't told you how to find them. Okay, so, uh, so now I present to you an algorithm, which is uh, in a sense uh, related to the so-called uh, uh, Borel uh, DC benzol theory. Uh, well, maybe I, since I don't have time, so I probably won't go into details of this theory. Uh, let me just uh, uh, state the result. So this is, I guess, uh, theorem five. Um, so up to the action of the vowel group. Uh, good root subsystems are exactly uh, those root subsystems uh, of phi uh, obtained uh, as follows. So step one, uh, I take a connected uh, component. Um, maybe let me call it uh, maybe D uh, of the uh, Dinkin diagram uh, of phi. So I take a connected component only because I need to take care of uh, the possibility that uh, that phi is semi-simple but not simple. Um, and then I affinize uh, D uh, to an affine Dinkin diagram uh, D hat. Now remember, uh, in a Dinkin diagram or in an affine Dinkin diagram, each node has uh, what is called a Dinkin label. Uh, so what you do is you just look at the highest root, uh, you write it as a linear combination of, uh, of simple roots. And uh, for a node corresponding to some simple root, it's, uh, it's Dinkin label is just a coefficient of that simple root. Uh, so then what I do is I remove uh, two, nodes uh, uh, in D, sorry, in D hat, uh, whose Dinkin labels uh, are co-prime. And then I just uh, take uh, the root subsystem generated by Take the root subsystem uh, generated by uh, by the roots corresponding to the remaining nodes. And this uh, this algorithm, up to the action of the vowel group, uh, finds all uh, good root subsystems. Now this looks a bit complicated, but uh, if our phi is, uh, for example, of classical type, uh, then the algorithm is actually very simple. Uh, what you do is, well, you, you don't even have to, uh, you don't even have to affinize. Uh, what you do is you just uh, remove a node from, uh, from the original uh, Jenkins diagram. And then you take the root subsystem generated by the remaining nodes. Okay, yeah, I guess my time is up. Uh, well, yeah, maybe just one, one last remark. So I guess it's very uh, interesting to try to 
uh, develop a general theory of additive toric varieties so that uh, each toric variety uh, corresponds uh, in, in, some, uh, in, in some canonical way to a set of combinatorial data, like, like for our H bar and, uh, and the matroid that I mentioned. Uh, and this is uh, what I'm currently trying to do. All right, so uh, I guess I'll stop here. Thank you so much. <laughs>